Hi friends, thanks for joining us. Maybe noon or maybe night, maybe morning, wherever you are. Um, north, south, east or west, we're glad you're with us. Halted, unhalted. I'm today in Exodus chapter 20 and we're going through the book of Exodus. The coming out of the pandemic, I'm calling it. And we come to the Ten Commandments. Not everybody's favorite text. Uh, some call them suggestions, but I want to call them a template to live by. And um, especially in this day and age, 2021 has not had the best start, especially since the sixth uh, Wednesday of this last week uh, began very disturbing. And uh, it, it hurt, to be quite frank, and for those that are watching from outside of our country, uh, we're grieved. And we haven't seen this since the British in 1814 burned the White House down. Or you could go to Andrew Jackson's party on his inauguration in 1829, and there have been other attacks on the White House by individuals. But not, we haven't seen anything like this before, and it's very disturbing. And on both sides, whether you wear your hat frontwards or backwards, I don't care. It's, it should disturb all godly people. Um, we're a, a country of laws and order, and we, we uh, believe in some legal templates and Judeo-Christian values. And that's where we get our go-to for chapter 20 today of the book of Exodus. And I, I won't read it all to you. You're very familiar with it. But uh, this is at our very core of who we are as a people group. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take, uh, not make for yourself a graven image, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And and so we, co we come into the Ten Commandments, and we have this vertical relationship thing with the first four. It's relationship to God. Then the others are the relationship to each other. So there's two parts, and it starts out with no other gods before me. I mean, who brought you out of Egypt? Who took care of you? Who bore you on eagle's wings? I think that's the 16th chapter of Exodus. And then no graven images or likeness, and it has that generational part of that uh, God speaks, for I, the Lord, your God, <clears throat> am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And so there's a generational connection to what you worship. If you choose to worship graven images, if you choose to worship ungodly uh, idols, it's going to impact your family for generations to come. So the first two are specifically uh, to God and in our vertical relationship, as is the next one, that uh, not take the Lord's name in vain. And some people have gotten really flippant with this. And I encourage you to reread this because verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who take his name in vain. And this is done with a tongue. And there's a lot more that back this up with in regards to watching our tongue and putting a guard on our tongue. But to take God's name that's holy and reverent and begin to use it flippantly to make your point, if you would, uh, is what God is speaking to. Don't do it. Reverence the name. Use it reverently. Holy. He is God. And then we switch a little bit. We'll spend a little bit more time on this. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's verse 8. And six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, uh, nor your cattle, nor your strain, <laughs> nor your... Uh, stranger who is within your gates, everybody's going to take a day of rest. No work on the Sabbath. And the Hebrew word for Sabbath, by the way, is desist. You just rest. And God set the uh, example of that in the creation story, he created the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. And it was set aside 
uh, unto God. It's uh, it's God's day. This is the this is God's day. Now we take it in the New Testament to be the Lord's day, and we practice our worship on Sunday. I know some people have said, well, we should be doing it on Saturday, and and uh, we could get into a little bit on that, but. Uh, we used to have blue laws. I don't know if any of you remember blue laws. I remember hearing about them because I was raised in the north and uh, didn't have too much of it, but I knew a lot of stores were closed. And evidently, pennies uh, broke all the blue laws when they opened on Sunday, but you couldn't go swimming on Sunday, couldn't go dating on Sunday, didn't read a newspaper on Sunday, didn't do all these certain little things, lots of regulations. And the rabbis had 1,521 Sabbath laws. 15 1,521 Sabbath laws. Now, really, who's going to follow all, who's going to know all 1,521? And and so a lot of the things when we came out of that, maybe they came, maybe practicing uh, worship on Sunday was a little bit out of tradition, but there are some things that, that are critical for us. The Sabbath is Saturday. That you, you can't defute. But when you get into the New Testament, the early Christians, they continued some Sabbath worship. And you see Paul going into the synagogue on the Sabbath. But he also practiced worship on the Lord's Day. And it was called the Lord's Day because the first day of the week, all four Gospels say it, the first day of the week, the Lord rose from the grave. So they started celebrating the Lord's resurrection. And for a time, they probably did both. At least that's true with uh, Paul's life, but but it transitioned to celebrating the Lord on Sunday and identifying that as the early Christian worship day. And there are several reference to that, Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, Revelation 1, 20, when, uh, or 1, 10, when John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I think that is one of the greatest scriptures. I just love the fact that he's in exile and a rock quarry, and and he's celebrating the Lord's Day. He knows that it's Sunday. He knows it's the first day of the week, and he's celebrating that this is the day that the Lord rose from the grave. Um, there are some other references, and I don't want to blur the lines too much, but uh, there are some references. In, well, I'll read one of them in Romans 14, that uh, Paul talking to the Romans in verse 5 one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he does and who does it not observe it the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. So a little confusing to read it, but um right out of the right out of the uh, text if you don't take it into context but he's dealing with uh, some of the law the old testament law the new testament grace and so he's moving the congregation to this because evidently some of them were saying hey you're not doing it on the sabbath you're wrong and of course that was one of the jews biggest uh, outside of who the messiah is they challenged the new believers the christians on what day they worshiped and uh, there are other texts that um, endorse this as well. And you, it's hard, you're hard pressed to find a Sabbath endorsement of the fourth commandment that is listed in verse 8 of Exodus 20. You're hard pressed to find that um, endorsed in the New Testament. So, what day should we worship? Well, I've often said kind of tongue-in-cheek that if we worshiped on Mondays, Mondays would be better days. But I do feel that if you're going to go all the way with the Old Testament and practice Sabbath, there's probably a lot more that you need to be practicing. I do feel, here's my resolve, I do feel the early church practice on Sunday. And it preceded the Roman church. And that's where a lot of people say, well, that was man-made. Sunday was man-made, uh, Sabbath was God-made. And I get that, I understand that, that's true. The early church practice on Sunday, what, but you could also say that God established Sunday as the Lord's resurrection day. So, you know, th there's both sides of that. 
And the New Testament frees believers from Sabbath worship uh, on, uh, uh, or worshiping, frees believers to worship on any day, every day. And um, so if we're doing it wrong, here's another factor. If, we, if we've been doing it wrong for 2,000 plus years, you see, God, God is a God that brings correction. Hebrews brings that out very well. He brings correction. And if we were doing it wrong, I feel convinced in my heart, two things. If we were doing it wrong, I feel God would convict us and correct us. Convict and correct, the two C words. Because it is his nature to love us as children and if necessary, bring correction. And so I know you can't base a theology that's... Uh, uh, as biblical as you'd like to on this, but here's here's what I really do feel, a confidence in my own heart that God has not convicted me of worshiping on Sunday and uh, has not cor brought correction and does not give a definitive response to the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 in the New Testament. There's no New Testament text that specifically says, keep it on the Sabbath. But I do feel that we blur the lines when we're not resting, we're not participating in this teaching of a rest day. And I'll, I'll end with that in just a moment. So don't drop the concept of the Sabbath because I think that's where we miss the boat. And um, uh, I'll come back to that. But here's number five that is listed in verse 12, and that is to honor your father and your mother. I hope that's not hard for you. And if you're a person that just loves family conflict, uh, stay out of my family tree. I, I don't want it. I want to embrace this. I enjoy embracing this. And um, honor your father and your mother. And here's the promise that that the, the verse says, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Oh, man, that's good. You want to live a long time? You want to be blessed? You want to live in peace? Honor your mom and dad. And then here's the other thing. They're all relationship and they're, they're horizontal relationship. So after you get through the first four, then you move to verse five. Honor your father and mother. This is, this is uh, uh, horizontal. You shall not murder, verse 13. You shall not commit adultery, verse 14. You shall not steal, verse uh, 15. And uh, number nine, but you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, verse 16. And then the final one, shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, servants. I have never, ever coveted ox, donkey, or anything in my neighbor's house. And um, um, I'll touch on that for just a minute, though, because you do look over at your neighbor. and My neighbor might be watching this. And he he would know this because I would say this to his face. He is the best. He has the best manicured lawn. He takes care of his lawn. It's greener than all the rest. And I get a little envious of how green. And so I asked him, "What do you put in it?" And he told me, and he just cares for it. And I'm so grateful he does because he is uh, upwind from me, and the and the lawn on the other side is loaded with dandelions. It's a rental facility, and and the care is just different. And so the dandelions come over, and he's my DMZ. He stops those. He fights those dandelions. And so when the wind carries the seed, I get blessed because my neighbor takes such great care. And I'm not going to be envious. I'm going to be grateful. Your, your neighbor may have an F-350 pulling a 30-foot tra uh, trailer, or he may have, or pulling here something, pulling a 34-foot uniflight. Or even a 25-foot glass fly. Yeah, I know my boats and I know my name. And so you have this, uh, we have this ability in us, if we're not careful, to become envious and begin to covet what our neighbor has. They may have a bigger house. Uh, one of my neighbor, one of the neighbors on the inside has a beautiful house. I really like it. And I can't think that it helps the value of my house by he having such a really nice, a nicer home than mine. And uh, that works for me too. So don't let envy rule your heart because envy is a step from covetousness and then the next step, you don't like your neighbor anymore and there goes your horizontal relationship with your neighbors. And this is what God is trying to cut out. You also begin to lust after 
uh, things that uh, you, you shouldn't. Want, and you, it's not wa wanting isn't wrong. Wanting something can't be wrong because it's loaded in the Bible, uh, and so you just have to be careful when it moves to envy and covetousness and lusting after something. Then it's wrong, and and it breaks up that horizontal relationship. Conclusion. Uh, right relationship to God, the first four. Right relationship to God. And then right relationship to each other. And that's what the Ten Commandments, that's what these Judeo-Christian values bring to us. And now I, I wanted to go back and just touch bases on something that I said earlier that, that I would talk about. How to, You see, we're going to have church re-entry. We're going to have re-entering into church when the pandemic's over. We're coming out of our pandemic Egypt time, and and um, and we're getting closer. God's going to help us. We're going to get closer. So how do you how do you do how do you get the family back if you're not already going? How do you how do you do this? How do you regenerate uh, some interest in going to church, especially if you're raising kids and with family? And I, and I wanted to share with you. There's a book called Making Sunday Special by Karen Maines. I read it a long time ago. I think she's out of um, 100 Huntley Street, the the uh, Canadian PTL, and. She wrote a really good book, and I remember reading it and said, oh, my mom did that. My mom did that. And she knew all that, making Sunday special. And I didn't even know she could have written the book. But uh, Karen Maines did a great job on this book. And she said one of the things that she said that was really good, said, get ready on Saturday to make Sunday special. And my mom did that. We prepped. One of the things that we never did as kids growing up, we didn't spend the night at somebody else's house. In fact, we didn't even ask because we knew the house rule. House rules. House rules are on Saturday night, we're at home because we're going to get ready. And on Sunday morning, we're going to church. And she didn't want anybody at somebody else's house, didn't get up early, didn't get ready. And uh, and went, so we missed the car ride. We had a big family, had a big station wagon, and everybody had to pile in. And we picked up other kids. We were kind of like church uh, Sunday school bus ministry in a in a big uh, uh, station wagon so mom didn't want us to miss a ride so you prep she bathed everybody set out our clothes did all those kind of things got ready and and then um, and then make so get ready on Saturday start thinking about it on Saturday just think about it and then Sunday um, make church celebratory it needs to be a celebration it that's the way the church that's why it started because the lord w rose from the grave on sunday it's a celebration so find the joy of life in sunday find the joy of life in celebrating sunday and find a way if it's if it's if it's something that's difficult because of the maybe you do high church or something and maybe it's a little more um, uh, tight to do uh, to, to express celebration but find ways to express celebration you can do it and uh, and find ways to celebrate that this is the Lord's Day it could be that you do something for somebody else and 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 I know that you know big part of this is rest it's rest unto the Lord and uh, you don't want to crowd the day so badly that you're just whipped by the by the end of Sunday that's not going to work either so you have to find some rest. It's not that you do all the celebratory things that I'm talking about all on the on every single week. We didn't do that, but sometimes we went out for dinner, and of course that means that someone else is working, so we didn't do that all the time. We invited people to our home. Uh, sometimes, you know, a lot of times I don't mind a nap. A nap is a really good way to rest. But I want to do something some activity into my day that recognizes that God has done a transformational work in me and this is his day. And so it's work six, rest the one. And always the, the equation throughout the Old Testament is the same. God worked six days and rested on the seventh. It says in the 20th chapter, work six, rest on the seventh. And to us, Traditionally, it's been the first day of the week that we would rest or we do something to honor God, to recognize him, to celebrate that he came into this world, uh, rose from the grave, and, um, and we're celebrating that transformational work of the resurrection. So find a way to do it. It could be write a letter, could make a phone call, could be helping somebody, could be doing some benevolence, it could be doing something with your family. Family, I would put high on the list. I would put... Uh, Worship with other believers high on my list 
and recognizing that um, uh, God has given me a family. If you don't have a family, maybe you can find someone to enjoy, but make sure that you also do so worship with family, with church family, Hebrews 10, 25. Don't forsake the body of Christ. So those kind of things make it a day unto the Lord, Sunday, my day, to say thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in my life. So Lord, bless all those that are watching and listening. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Ten Commandments. Thank you for the rule of law and order in our lives. Thank you for this template that helps us live. Bless each word, each person that's watching this program. I pray your blessing upon them. Pray that you keep them safe and healthy in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.